All right, in this video, I'm going over principal agent modeling, which is so fun. It's, you're gonna love it. Basically, there's two players in your model, um, and one is trying to influence the other, and the two models connect to each other in a really fun way, and when you finally get them to connect, it's really satisfying. You're gonna love it. So um, I go through three models, the first of which is going to be um, a classic principal agent model, which is an employer-employee model. And then I'm gonna go over a teacher-student model, and then I'm going to go over a government-citizen um, model. Now, um, the classic principal agent is ba situation is basically where the principal is trying to get the agent to do the bidding for him or her. And um, you have to come up with a structure of incentives to make sure that that agent is doing what you want. But the structure actually applies to other situations. Anytime one player's um, choice variable is exogenous in another player's problem, it can have this format. And so um, I'll, you'll see what I mean when you actually see the modeling. Let's get going. So to begin with, um, actually, let's look at the principal agent structure first. So, um, for, so you're going to have um, a, the principal is the one influencing the agent. So a lot of times, if you think of it as a hierarchical structure, the principal has more power than the agent in a lot of these situations. Not necessarily all of them, but a lot of them. So let's look at that visually. Okay, so you have a situation where the, the principal is making some kind of decision that's going to influence the behavior or the choices of the agent. So um, you, a lot of times I'll think of this in a hierarchical structure where the principal is higher, the agent is lower, even though you may find some scenarios where that's not necessarily the case. Um, for example, you could actually do this with citizen and um, politician, where the citizen is trying to get the politician to do the citizen's bidding for them, and um, <clears throat> in which case the citizen might be the principal if the citizen has some way of threatening the politician into doing what the citizen wants. Actually, maybe a better situation there would be a um, large company that wanted the politician to do their bidding. So that wouldn't even be voting, that would be like bribing them or um, influencing them in some other way to try to get the politician to do what you want. So. Um, <clears throat> Basically, basically, there's this structure of principal agent. You'll see it when we model what it looks like in a model, but oftentimes you view it as a hierarchical structure because oftentimes there is a power dynamic at play between the two players. But let's get going. Okay, so we have the principal's model. This is the employer choosing what commission rate to give their employee. And of course, that's the percentage of every sale they make that the employee gets to keep. And the um, what are they maximizing? What sort of optimization problem is this employer doing? Well, they really want higher sales. So what they care about is the dollar value in sales that the employee makes. And of course, sales depend on the effort of the employee and effort of the employee depends on the commission rate. Um, but the employer doesn't get the entire dollar amount of the sales, they only get what's left over after the commission percentage. So if the commission percentage that the employee gets is 40%, then one minus C is what's left over at, after that 60% which the employer gets to keep. And this is um, this does have cost and benefit uh, arranged into this. You could distribute this out and you'd have um, You'd have this uh, sales as a function of employee effort as a function of commission minus employee's commission rate times sales, and that minus part would be the cost in this framework. Um, you can kind of see how that model works out to get an optimal commission rate that's not zero and it's not 100%, it's somewhere in between. So let's connect this to the um, employee's model, which is the agent's model. Okay, so what's fun about this is I've defined no new variables. All of these variables um, existed up here, so we can kind of connect them um, to see how this plays out. So um, if we have 
uh, the employee is maximizing by choosing E, which is the employee's effort. That makes sense as a choice variable for the employee. So um, that's good. And what do they get? Um, if they put forth more effort, they get higher dollar values of sales. And of course, sales depends on effort. And how much of that do they get to keep? They get to keep the commission percentage. So it's just the commission times the total sales. This is the income they get. Um, but why don't they put an infinite amount of effort into this? Um, they don't because effort is painful. It's effortful. So we subtract effort in terms of the person's utility, the employee's utility that they're maximizing when they're deciding how much effort to put forth. So this is the employee's optimization problem. Oh, and of course sales we have up here in both problems. Um, effort is in both problems. Commission rate. Now this we notice, and this is actually key to the principal agent situation, um, we have commission is exogenous to the employee. So we could put a bar over that just to emphasize the fact that that's exogenous but it's the choice variable of the principal. And that is one key feature of principal agent models. The choice variable that the principal has is inside the agent's problem as an exogenous variable. That will be important. Um, minus effort, which of course is in both problems. Now we can solve both of these problems, right? Um, and the, the important and interesting one to solve is the employee's problem, the agent's problem, because when we take the first order conditions of this, yada, 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 what that's going to give us is the optimal choice, effort star, which is the optimal choice for effort, as a function of every exogenous variable in that agent's problem. Well, what's the exogenous variable here? It's C, um, the commission rate. So effort, optimal effort as a function of commission. Um, now, does this function look familiar to you? Actually, it should, because this function appears up in the principal's problem. So here we've got this function, which is the optimization, it's the solution to the agent's problem. Um, the optimal amount of effort that the agent puts forward is a function of commission. And uh, that is something that's in the objective function of the principal. So that connection, those two connections that sort of feed back on each other, those are the key to good principal agent modeling. And to summarize what is this, it's the choice variable of the principal appears in the agent's Pro maximization problem as an exogenous variable. As a result of that, the optimal choice for the agent is a function of that um, thing that's the choice variable for the principal, which is exogenous in this model, and that is part of the objective function. It's part of the thing that the principal is trying to maximize, and this pattern appears over and over in these problems, and when you get these connected, it just it's so satisfying, you're gonna love it. Let's do another problem. Okay, so um, we have the teacher's maximization problem, and of course the teacher is the principal. And the teacher is trying to decide how frequently to have quizzes for the students in the class. Um, and what does the teacher care about? Well, the teacher mostly cares about student learning, L. That's what the teacher is trying to optimize. I mean, that's pretty close to a social welfare function, if you think about it. But the teacher also cares a little bit about their grading effort. They only have a certain amount of energy in the day, and so they can't have an infinite number of quizzes. Um, so the, the thing they're optimizing, the objective function for the teacher, is going to be student learning minus effort grading. Um, and of course, the reason you have more quizzes is because having more quizzes increases the frequency at which students study. If you don't have any quizzes and only have one big exam at the end of the semester, um, students are going to wait till the end of the semester to study, and we know for sure that that isn't a good way to learn. So the teacher wants students to spread out their studying throughout the semester because we know then they, they study a little bit, they sleep on it, they dream about the things they're, um, they're studying, and that 
um, embeds it into their brains in a way that's much uh, much stronger in terms of learning. So um, the student learning is a function of how frequently students study and that's a function of how many quizzes are during the semester. And of course, grading effort obviously also depends on quizzes. So that's the teacher's objective function. Let's look at the student's objective function. Okay, so the student's objective function is that they're choosing how frequently they study. So here we have a connection between the models. Um, studying frequency appears in the objective function for the principal, and it is a choice variable for the agent, for the student. And um, how do they decide what, how much, how frequently to study? Well, they care about their grades, and they care about the disruption of their daily schedule. Um, they have a fun daily schedule that would involve a lot of sports and hanging out with friends and they have to disrupt that to study more frequently which is super annoying and so the utility function or the objective function for the students is they're maximizing grades minus disruption of daily schedule where both of those things depend on how frequently they study now this function of grades what's the relationship between frequency of studying and grades that function is going to be modified by how frequently um, the professor has quizzes. So we could actually look at a graph of this function and see how it changes when this exogenous variable um, number of quizzes in the semester changes. So actually let's connect the two models in that way. So we have the choice variable for the principal is going to appear as an exogenous variable in the agent's problem. So let's connect those and let's remind ourselves that in the agent's problem, number of quizzes per semester is exogenous because students have no control over how many quizzes they have during the semester. So classic structure of principal agent. Um, oh, and let me label this with agent. The student is the agent. All right, so now let's actually look at this graph just to see how does this exogenous variable work. How does the number of quizzes modify the relationship between uh, frequency of studying and grades? Okay, so we have a diminishing marginal benefit shape to our grades function. This is grades as a function of how frequently you study. The more frequently you study, the higher your grades are going to be. But of course, there's diminishing marginal benefits. If you study a little bit every single hour in the semester, that's not that much better than studying a little bit every other hour during the semester. Classic shape. Um, so I've drawn the shape assuming there's a high number of quizzes. Like me, this might be, there's 10 quizzes during the whole semester. If you reduced that to two quizzes in the whole semester, then you can actually achieve higher grades um, at every frequency of studying, just because um, it, it, I mean, just because of the nature of that relationship. So, uh, so let's write, it, write that out on the graph. So if there's a low number of quizzes during the semester, um, you're going to be able to achieve higher grades at every uh, level of frequency of studying. So um, this tells us that the Q exogenous variable is going to modify this relationship. All right, so that's the first half of the principal-agent relationship is the fact that the choice variable in the principal's problem is exogenous in the agent's problem. And then to finish this out, we need to solve the agent's problem, the student's problem, to figure out what is their optimal time spent studying S star, which will be a function of any exogenous variable in the problem. And then we're going to need to find that in our, um, in our teacher's objective function. Okay, so the solution to the student's optimization problem is the optimal time spent studying depends on how many quizzes the professor assigns during the semester. So let's see if we can find this function inside the teacher's objective function. And of course we can. There it is. This function is the same as this function. In fact, this function is derived from this function. So let's just go ahead and connect those up. And now we've finished. We, we've, oh, oh let, let me add a star. That's the funnest part is adding the star. It's like, 
um, the cherry on top of the problem, you've solved the puzzle, you've figured it out, you've made this nice, wonderful, interconnected series of models that capture deep, important intuitions. So, um, so this is a wonderful principal agent model. So much fun. Let's do one more, and this next one is actually probably not considered a classic principal agent model, but it's going to have the same structure. And it's used a lot in economics, which is a government social welfare function, and how does that relate to things that the government may be trying to get their citizens to do. So we're going to look at a model of the government trying to reduce smoking in the population, and then the citizens' decision about how much to smoke. 